Hi, my name's Steve Mann and welcome to the History of Papermaking unit, one of 11 units in my Introduction to Papermaking short course. I hope you enjoy it and I hope to re you return for more. This unit looks at the invention of paper. It looks at how the manufacturing technique traversed the globe and how materials and machinery had to really evolve to uh, fit in with their surroundings at the time and the economic demands of uh, the nations. Towards the end of this course, we'll also look at how the use of paper has changed. When paper was first invented, it was meant to be essentially a communication device. It was a means of recording the written word. But today it has many uses. Packaging, filtration, security devices, even DNA storage. So let's move on and uh, see what happens. Paper making actually began with the humble wasp some 60 million years ago. The wasp was chewing lumps out of trees, spitting it out and the resulting pulp was then being flattened to make the walls of its nest. The Egyptians, as you see here in this example of the um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they made paper from a, a material from a plant called the papyrus plant. The papyrus plant has a, a long wide stalk and they took this cork and they slit it down, opened it up and made slivers of this material. They then put these slivers crisscross this fashion, rather like we do with plywood, wet it, beat it with mallets and then laid it out into the sun to dry. And I have for you here just a piece of such a papyrus and you can just about see the structure. So you can see how the stalks have been opened, laid that way, laid that way and then they're bonded together. But it was left to the Chinese to invent paper as we know it today. There was a courtier in China by the name of Sai Lung and he saw the problems of their particular recording media. The written word was either stored on rolls of silk which was very expensive or piece of the bamboo which was very heavy and cumbersome and he thought there has to be a better way of doing it. So he experimented and of course China was well known for its silk production. Silk production came from silk worms. Silk worms only feed on the mulberry tree so there were lots of mulberry trees around. So one of his experimental materials was the bark of the mulberry tree or paper mulberry tree as it became known. He mixed the fibres from that bark with bits of old fishing net and one or two other things and made this slurry of fibres just like we produce a slurry of fibres today. He then made himself a bit of a sieve. He took a, a frame, put across it very thin slivers of bamboo to make a sieve and then dipped this sieve into his trough of fibres, lifted it out being careful to keep it very horizontal and there he had cast his very first ever piece of paper. Well, the Chinese thought this was an absolutely wonderful invention and worthy of being kept secret. And so for many years, the Chinese did the best to keep this technique as a state secret. Eventually, however, there was a big battle between the Muslims and the Chinese at a river called Talas. It became known as the, the Battle of Talas. And during that battle, many Chinese were taken as slaves. And amongst those slaves were some of the uh, Chinese paper makers. And so the method of making paper was extracted from these. And then the Muslims started to make paper. So from its beginnings in China, it went through to the river Talas, eventually it came into Baghdad and for some time Baghdad was the global capital of paper making. 
As the Muslim Empire expanded, it travelled through Egypt, Libya, up into Morocco, and then from the Morocco, the Moors invaded Spain. And along with these uh, travelling armies came the secret of making paper. And for the first time, paper was made on European soil. There was a northerly travel of the paper-making knowledge from uh, Morocco into Spain and then into France. And it was some 300 years later, 1490, when the technique for making paper actually reached England. It was another 100 years after that, 1590, when it reached Scotland, and another 100 years after that, 1690, before it reached North America. In actual fact, there was some paper making going on in Mexico in 1590. That technique was taken over um, by the Spanish who invaded Mexico, but it didn't get up into North America until 1690. Now, France had a very large part to play in the development of mechanical paper making as we know it today. In the late 17, 1700s, the Napoleonic Wars were going on. At that time, France actually used paper money and there was, a, there was extremely high inflation. Because of the high inflation, there was more demand for paper for money, but there were fewer men around to make it because they were all fighting Napoleon's battles. So it fell to a soldier come engineer come clerk by the name of Louis Nicolas Robert to come up with a mechanical device for making paper. He went to look at the mill where, currency, where the security papers, the currency paper was made in the traditional way, one piece at a time by taking the mould and dipping it into the vat of fibres exactly as the Chinese had done a thousand years before. And being an, have an engineering background, his natural response was, well, you need a machine to make this. And so he was given the remit of inventing a machine for the mechanical production of paper. And in 1799, he applied for and was granted a patent for such a machine. There was a bit of a fallout between himself and the owner of the mill and uh, the owner of the mill decided that maybe there was it would be better to try and continue to develop this um, this machine in England rather than uh, in France. So a relative of his, John Gamble, took the idea from Calais over into uh, Dover where he met the Lord Mayor of Dover he told the Lord Mayor of Dover his story about this wonderful machine and the Mayor said I know exactly the people you need to meet they're a couple of paper merchants by the name of Henry and Seely Fordrinia well he told them the story and they immediately saw what a wonderful uh, invention this could be if it could be made to work so they called upon one of their engineers, a guy by the name of Brian Donkin, and they gave him the job of developing an improved version of this French machine. And he set up a place just outside of Hemel Hempstead to do just that. And in 1801, he too was granted a patent for the improved mechanical production of paper. Although the method was technically successful, financially, it was a disaster. Why was it a disaster? Because the Fordrini brothers poured everything into this. And they thought, well, that's okay. We'll get this machine to work. And then we'll get all our money back from the royalties and the licenses because everybody will want one. However, everybody did want one. Lots of people got them, but no one paid them any money. And so sadly, this machine, this is the modern version of a Fordrenia, of the old original Fordrenia. This, all that's left now of the Fordrenia brothers is their name. 
The principles are still the same. Here we have a breast roll supporting the wire. The stock flows out of the floor box onto the wire. There are a forming board there initially to inhibit the drainage of the stock. As it moves along, there are in those days there will be table rolls. Today there will be foils to help to drain the water. Then we have vacuum foils. Then we have to start to spend money and have some uh, high vacuum boxes linked to uh, vacuum pumps. And then over the cooch roll and off into the press section. So that's a modern version of the piece of equipment that uh, was developed just outside of Hemel Hempstead. Now amazingly on the plot next to where this was being developed there was another inventor a guy by the name of John Dickinson and John Dickinson had the idea well yeah there must be other ways of uh, putting stock onto a wire he thought what he did was he made this round trough or vat filled it full of paper making stock and immersed into it a cylinder with a mesh wall and his idea was as the cylinder revolves the water will drain through the mesh it will carry the fibres with it the fibres will stick on the surface of the mesh and then we can bring them out of here transfer them onto a felt and take them away and dry them. And for several years these two inventions fought head to head for dominance. Eventually the flat wire system won because there are limits to how fast that farmers can actually uh, travel and the flat wire could travel faster therefore the overhead cost came down, paper became, paper became cheaper and this method now it only tends to be used for things that can be made at a very slow rate. Things like multiply board and security papers, etc. Anyway, that's enough of uh, men and machinery. Let's just have a look at the, just a, a glance at the numbers involved. If you remember, paper making originally was all about a method of holding the written word. But look at today, virtually 50% of all paper and board produced is used for packaging applications. Here we have printed and writings, the original use of it, and newspapers, you could class that as communication as well. Tissue is an increasing sector, and then finally there's a catch-all others, things like DNA storage for example. So that's a, a very quick overview of some of the paper markets, not, not too much detail. But who makes paper and who uses paper? What I would ask you to do here is look at the first three lines. For many years, America has been the largest producer of paper and board in the world. But look at the production between 2000 and 2007. 85 83, 84 million tonnes. Pretty stagnant. Amazingly, look at Japan in 2000. For several years, Japan has been the second largest producer of paper and board in the world. And that's amazing, really. Always surprises me. It's such a tiny island, it has no natural resources. They bring in everything that they need. They bring in the wood pulp, they bring in the chemicals, they assemble them to produce an added value product and then they export it. But look at the Japanese production figures again in the same period 32 million tonnes, 31 million tonnes, 31 million tonnes again fairly stagnant. China however has decided that it is going to be the largest producer of paper and board in the world and look at Chinese production 31 million tonnes in 2000, almost 50 million tonnes in 2004, 60% increase. 65 million tonnes in 2007, so they've more than doubled production in those seven years. 
and China's production rates continue to increase. It won't be long before they've achieved their target of being the largest producers in the world. So we've seen who produces paper and board, but who uses it? This table shows a range of countries producing or using a range of volumes. It's arguable, but people who study demographics of countries and people who, uh, who study pop, uh, population trends use the per capita consumption of paper and board as a measure of the degree of advancement of that particular society. Look at the top five there, Finland, USA, Sweden, Japan, Germany, all using almost 250 kilos or above per person. When we get down to China, 45 kilos per year per person. Russia, 36 kilos per year per person. Pakistan, 5.6 kilos per year per person. So, maybe there's something in it, maybe there's not. It's up to you to decide. If we go closer to home now, or my home anyway, and look at UK production. UK production was steadily increasing until the year 2000. 2000 was our best year. We produced some 6.4 million tonnes of paper and board. But since then, there's been a slow decline. The decline of mills has been even more rapid. In the year 2000, there was exactly 100 mills left in the UK. By the end of this year, by the end of 2012, there will be just 48 mills left. In one of the other modules, we'll be talking about fibres. We'll look at sources of fibre such as wood and non-wood, and we'll look at recycled fibre. So, before we leave this module, it's worth just talking a little bit about recycled fibre. Recycling fibre has both economic and social advantages. Just two examples. The more fibre we, we reuse, then the less fibre there is to go to landfill. So that's a nice social advantage. The more fibre we reuse, then the less virgin fibre we have to import from other countries. So that's going to reduce the country's balance of payments. So, UK reuses almost 50% of its own fibre. And about a third of that fibre goes to China. But why does it go to China? And how can they afford to ship waste all the way to China? Well, it's very simple, really. As, Chinese, as the Chinese manufacturing base increases, then the more they manufacture, the more they need to export. And in order to export things, you need to package them. And what's the best packaging material? It's made from recycled fiber. But what about the cost? Well, containers are arriving every day from China with Chinese goods. And if we didn't fill them with waste paper, they would go back empty. So for a nominal fee, they're filled with waste paper. So it makes it a very economic uh, balance. Well, that's the end of the history module. I hope you found it both interesting and enjoyable. And I hope you'll return and try some of my other modules. Thank you. Goodbye.